Hello, everybody. We just wait for everyone to be able to get into the room and then we will get started. They're still coming. Thank you, Doug. I think, I think we might get started. So hello everyone and welcome um, this afternoon to another Lymphoma Australia educational webinar. I'm Lisa, one of the nurses at Lymphoma Australia. Um, you may often see me on these webinars or chat to me on the phone or you often get emails from me. Um, I'd like to begin by acknowledging the traditional owners of the land and I'd also like to pay respects to elders past and present. I'll start with some quick housekeeping. Please, if you have any questions throughout the webinar, put them in the Q&A function. It's in the middle of your screen down the bottom. Um, and we will have a small amount of time at the end to answer some. Um, there is also a chat function. It's also down the bottom. Um, but this will not be monitored for questions. So please use the Q&A if you do have a question. There is the ability to upvote questions. So if somebody does have a question that you also like, you can vote on that one to be answered as well. Um, if you miss anything today, please don't stress. The webinar will be recorded and then uploaded to YouTube within the next few days and we'll send the link out to you as well. Um, we have been very busy building our webinars for the year and have quite a few planned um, on different subtypes as well as supporting families, social and welfare considerations and are planning a patient summit um, in Sydney around September around World Lymphoma Awareness Day. Um, so if you do have something specific you would like us to organise, please reach out to us. Um, we want to ensure that we are meeting your needs around education and support. So we're always open to your ideas. Um, there is a quick survey link at the end of this webinar um, that will pop up when it's finished. So please fill this out. And this also just helps us with our planning around what your needs are. Um, and for anyone who isn't aware, we do hold regular online support groups via Zoom. So our next one is the 4th of May, and this one's for patients who are currently undergoing treatment. Um, and then there's another one later in May for anyone, anyone and everyone, really. So if you just feel welcome to join us. They're very quite informal, just a nice way for you to chat to some people. Um, I'll pop the, the link for the events calendar in the chat, and you can go there and just have a look at what we've got planned for the year. Okay, so anyway, on to today's webinar, which is Relapse Refractory Diffuse Large B-Cell Lymphoma. Um, this will be presented by Dr. Gareth Gregory. So Gareth is a clinical lead for the Hematology Clinical Research Unit and leads the Aggressive Lymphoma Surface at Monash Health and School of Clinical Sciences at Monash University. Um, Gareth is a Senior Research Fellow at Monash University and the Victorian Cancer Agency Clinical Research Fellow. Um, his main passion in in haematology is to improve outcomes for patients with lymphoma through access to clinical trials and translational research to better select therapies for patients. Um, he's also a member of the Australasian Leukemia and Lymphoma Group Working Parties for Lymphoma and Laboratory Science. He is a founding steering com committee member for the Australasian Lymphoma Alliance and is a member for the Women in Lymphoma Champions of Change Committee. He's also very active in national and international clinical research, and we thank him very much for joining to us today and presenting for us. Thanks, Lisa, and apologies for the bio. I probably should have given you a more abbreviated version. No, I like that one. <laughs> it just shows how much you do and how, how well versed you are in this area. No, thank you. And th thanks to you and, and Erica and all the team at Lymphoma Australia. I, I really enjoy having these um, opportunities to engage with patients and, and carers and community members. So thanks everyone for uh, for coming today. I hope this is of some interest and, and you learn something. I'm always learning in every interaction with patients. So hopefully I can give back in kind. I'm gonna try sharing my screen now and I'll just do a quick check to make sure that it's the right one that shares. Um, can I just get a quick, um, Lisa or Erica, just to confirm that yeah, is the right that's single screen? perfect. Beautiful, that's thank the right you. Screen. Yeah. Thanks. So um, as Lisa said, I'm Gareth. I'm one of the haematologists at Monash Health and Monash University. And my main area of expertise and interest is in aggressive lymphomas uh, and, and DLBCL or diffuse large B cell lymphoma accounts for the great majority of that. I spend most of my week dealing with um, patients and families who are coming through the journey from initial diagnosis through to relapse and beyond. So hopefully I'll, I'll take you through some of that journey today and make it a bit less scary for those of you who, who are considering what that might involve. 
Now I'll just put up a quick conflict disclosures. Um, I will be talking about some uh, therapeutic agents today. Well, sorry, that are um, that are industry um, developed agents. So I, I do have some disclosures to show here um, as per uh, roles that I've had in terms of clinical trial development of agents. I'm not paid to present today, nor am I going to present uh, with any focus on any particular agent over another, but just for the interest of disclosure, there they are. But we're here to talk today about diffuse large B-cell lymphoma. And one of the things that always strikes me uh, in dealing with patients with DLBCL is how no two patients are identical. And we see here two representative PET scans of newly diagnosed patients with DLBCL. They can often present with swelling of the glands due to lymphoma in the lymph nodes. But similarly, we can see patients occasionally presenting with extranodal disease, such as the PET scan on the right, where a patient basically had a lot of lung infiltration and the lining of their chest wall cavity. So we can see often that DLBCL presents in vastly different ways. But what is common is when we take a biopsy of a gland, we see a common appearance, which is sheets of large immature lymphocytes uh, basically effacing or taking up the entire gland. And that's uh, the entity that we are treating, irrespective of where it is in the body or uh, what the particular uh, drivers of it are for the individual patient. And the reason that's relevant is because we've known now for quite some time that DLBCL isn't a single disease. We give it a single name, but even at a gene expression level, if we look at the genes that are expressed in lymphomas from different patients, even going back to the year 2000, when this technology was being developed, we could see that there were two large subtypes of DLBCL according to the stage of the lymphocytes that they were before they developed mutations and became lymphoma. So already we knew there was more than one disease. Back then we used to call it GC or germinal center and ABC or activated B cell like. But the complexity becomes even a bit more, which is when we developed the ability to do genetic sequencing on patients' individual lymphoma samples, we could then see that there were a huge number of genes that are implicated in driving lymphoma for different patients. And believe it or not, for an average patient, we see at least 10 mutations of relevance in their lymphoma that are associated with causing it. I'm sorry that my slides keep skipping occasionally, so I'll just back it up. Um, this here is the 1001 DLBCL cases that were sequenced by a group at Duke University in the US. And what you can see, each of those very thin columns, if you were to draw one down, is an individual patient. And what you can appreciate is that really no two patients are identical in terms of the genes that are driving their lymphoma. And this is why we see such vastly different presentations in terms of where it presents and how it presents, but similarly why some patients will have diseases that are characterized by long periods of remission and hopefully cure, but some patients who may experience relapse of their disease and need further therapies. So let's just step back for a moment and say, how do we predict who might experience a relapse of their lymphoma through their journey? So we've known back to the original clinical trials when our first line therapy, which is currently standard RCHOP, rituximab with cyclophosphamide, doxorubicin, vincristine, and prednisolone, we call it RCHOP. Um, this has been standard of care since around the year 2000 based on a couple of clinical trials. This here was the Frunchu uh, study looking at younger patients where the addition of rituximab with the red line to CHOP showed improved uh, disease control versus uh, CHOP alone, which was the previous standard of care or versions of since about 1973. Um, PFS stands for progression-free survival, or basically how long from when a patient finishes their treatment until they may relapse if they do. Um, overall survival, as, as it states, is how long a patient survives from when their treatment finishes. Uh, these are what we call Kaplan-Meier curves. And so we start off at 100% of patients who haven't progressed or who are still alive. Um, but with time, unfortunately, we do see patients progressing and that's where the percentage reduces as time goes across on the right-hand side. I'll show a few curves like this and they may be familiar to some of you, but if not, um, the idea is the higher that these curves stay, the more patients remain in remission and alive, which is what we're always aiming for, obviously. Um, on the right-hand side here is the other study, which was the Quafia study in older patients. Uh, and as you can see, similar to the curves on the left, the addition of rituximab, which on the right is the solid lines, uh, associates with improved progression-free and overall survival. But even now you might see there's a couple of subtle differences and that's that on the left, the curves actually tend to stay a little bit higher in terms of the overall survival. And we'll come to that in a little while. And that's largely related to the fact that younger patients 
historically around this era when these treatments, these trials were done, you know, back 20 years ago, um, younger patients were able to have more options available to be able to get their lymphomas back in remission. And so that's why the overall survival curves for younger patients were higher back then. But we've certainly made a lot of gains, which I'll show you later on to bring these curves up on both sides. Now, what we have developed in the past was some fairly crude means by which to try and predict who might stay in remission and who might progress. And basically here, what we've got is the RIPI or the Revised International Prognostic Index. And what we can do is basically take a few clinical risk factors from patients with DLBCL, um, age, performance status, that's basically how fit or unfit someone is. To be a performance status of less than two, you should be able to undertake some light household duties throughout the day. Um, an elevation of the LDH or the lactate dehydrogenase, which is an enzyme inside many cells in our body. And in lymphomas that are aggressive, often that, that enzyme can increase in the blood because those cells are turning over and growing and destroying more rapidly. Uh, involvement of more than one extranodal site or more than one site outside of the glands and advanced stage disease. So stage three means it's both above and below the diaphragm or the breathing muscle in the middle of the, between the chest and abdomen. Stage four means there's involvement of other uh, extranodal sites as well. And what you can see on the right-hand side, or firstly starting on the left-hand side with the survival curves, is that we do see around one third of patients who will progress with their lymphoma, unfortunately, after initial rituximab chop like therapy. On the right-hand side, you can see that if we take combinations of these risk factors, if they don't have any of those five IRPI factors, then they're in the very good prognostic group, and there's a very low chance of experiencing progression of their lymphoma with time. If they've got one or two risk factors, they're in the good category. If they've got three or more factors, then that's when unfortunately they're in the poor category, which means there's a higher chance of the disease progressing. But please note that even in that situation, around 50% of patients in the poor risk group category will still stay in long-term remission. And that's really important to note. So we've had a patient who's come in, they've presented with lymphoma, we've staged them, we've diagnosed them, we've gone through the journey of RCHOP, we've treated them, they're in remission. But then there's a number of ways that relapse can unfortunately rear its head in those individuals for whom it happens. Commonly, it can be the development of a new lymph node enlargement, as shown on the left-hand side here, um, with swelling of a leg, etc. It can be due to constitutional symptoms, fevers in the absence of infection, drenching, night sweats, uh, significant loss of weight. We generally say 10% or more of your body weight unintentionally over a three to six month period. More rarely, it can be uh, suggested by blood test abnormalities, and that's where we perform blood tests um, as part of routine surveillance in some instances. And sometimes there are some electrolytes and enzymes that we can see uh, that might suggest a, a pattern of emerging relapse. I haven't put routine scans in here because historically trials were done to look at doing routine PET scans every three months in patients in their first remission. And we found that it didn't have any improvement in detecting relapses earlier. It didn't have any improvement in uh, the outcomes when we moved on to the next lines of therapy. What it did result in was a lot of unnecessary biopsies because someone's had a cough or a cold. One of their glands is a little bit in, uh, active on a PET scan and we end up having to biopsy it. So we don't tend to do routine PET scans for patients in their first remission because the majority of patients will stay in their first remission forever. So. What do we do if we suspect relapse? Well, the first thing we have to do is we need to biopsy it. And you might say, well, it, it looks like a zebra. It's got the same stripes it had before. Uh, how do we, why do we need to go through this again? But the reason is that we actually know that we do have patients who can have non-Hodgkin lymphoma at their first presentation but then relapse as Hodgkin lymphoma and vice versa. We also have other causes for swollen glands infections, inflammations, other pathologies that can get into the gland. So we always need to biopsy it again. That's a standard procedure to do to make sure that it is DLBCL and therefore we know that going through treatment for DLBCL or discussing the next pathway is the way to go. We need to restage. So another round, PET scans or imaging in order to de determine and document exactly where it is so we know at that time, right, this is where it is. Now we need to treat it and get rid of it. And for those of you who've been through this journey, 
here we go again is often the the sigh um, and moving on and saying, right, you have to go through all of that again, but yes, we do. Um, and that's just so we can make sure we know where it is. Similarly, in some patients, we do need to perform a bone marrow biopsy and that's to determine if there is involvement in the bone marrow because the pet is not often sensitive to that. We don't always need to, but sometimes we do. And in some patients uh, at progression, we need to actually stage their central nervous system, the brain, the lumbar uh, fluid around the spine, um, or we call it cerebrospinal fluid uh, and the spine to see that there's not involvement there because that can have implications for what therapies are needed to induce remission in those sites. In parallel to that, we are asking ourselves questions uh, and that is, um, what is the fitness of this patient? Because that basically will help to determine what the next appropriate treatment is to do. Um, are there significant health issues that would be a problem if we were to need to use consider more intensive therapies. Um, how old is the patient? Because arbitrarily age historically has been one of the, the, the considerations in terms of intensified therapy. Uh, and then we go through our lymphoma MDTs or multidisciplinary team meetings where we look at the scans, we look at the biopsies, we discuss the patient's other health issues, we discuss what our standard of care options are for in this scenario, we discuss what our clinical trial options are, and then usually from there we'll have a, a recommendation that we come back to the patient and their loved ones with and discuss what options are available. So what are those decisions or what does the algorithm look like? Well, firstly here is I guess a bit of a schema or a pathway, if you like. Uh, patients had DLBCL, they've had RCHOP or similar, uh, they're in remission, but unfortunately then has, has progressed. So the first thing we ask ourselves are some of these transplant eligibility considerations in the box on the red on the side. How old is a patient? If they're up to 65, usually that patient would be considered potentially eligible for a standard salvage chemotherapy consolidated by stem cell transplant. And I'll, I'll go through that a little bit in a moment. However, we do go up to older ages with this because we often do see patients up to more older ages these days who have very few or no comorbidities who actually do go through these procedures with, with no issues. We look at what other comorbidities there are, what other issues might cause problems if someone goes through a more intensified chemotherapy journey, what their response is to the salvage therapy. So even if we are uh, going through this pathway and discussing with a patient and saying, yes, salvage therapy looks to be the way. If the salvage therapy doesn't have a response on their chemotherapy, oh, sorry, on their lymphoma, then proceeding to the knockout punch, which is the autologous stem cell transplant, is, is unlikely to be of benefit. We also consider what the duration of first remission is. So in terms of salvage chemotherapy, it's a bit different to RCHOP. We have a number of different salvage regimens available. Most of them include what's called a platinum chemotherapy, which is a different class of chemotherapy. It acts differently on lymphoma cells and it's not part of our CHOP. So that's why platinum-based salvages are, are commonly used. I've put in the brackets there a few examples, RIS, RDAP, RGDP. Um, there's no set standard of care. And if you go to 10 different centres in Australia, you'll probably see a mix of those three used across them or potentially some that have slightly different but similar um, uh, acronyms uh, just due to one or two chemotherapies being slightly different. The overall effectiveness of these is all comparable, and I'll show you in a moment one of the trials that's compared a couple of these. But the whole idea of salvage chemotherapy is to say, right, this patient's lymphoma has unfortunately come back. Is it lymphoma now at relapse that is sensitive to chemotherapy? Because if it is, and if we can show that with a couple of cycles, two to three cycles of this chemo administered three weeks apart, and we can show that it, it's leading to a response, then that justifies going on to a more intensified chemotherapy, uh, one which would be the knockout punch for the lymphoma potentially, but from which the intensity of that chemo would actually cause the bone marrow to be suppressed. So low blood counts, anemia, low white cells at risk of infection, low platelets at risk of bleeding. And if we didn't do anything and we just gave the, that chemo, then often patients would have very low blood counts for weeks to months. But in order to be able to give this effectively, we give that intensified chemo as part of the autologous stem cell transplant. Then the next day, we give the patient their healthy stem cells back through the drip, which grow up in the bone marrow. And in that two to three weeks afterwards, where we're monitoring for infections, giving some blood transfusions as needed, things like that, the healthy bone marrow grows up, the blood counts grow up, and the patient's able to be discharged safely. So it's a very intensive process. For the salvage chemotherapies, often we bring patients in for two to three days. There are a couple of schedules that can be given as an outpatient. 
Um, we need to monitor usually once to three times a week, depending on the regimen, to, to monitor that the blood counts aren't dropping with those. Um, but unlike our chop, we don't give six cycles or more. We give th usually only two to three cycles of salvage to show that the lymphoma can respond to more intensive treatment. Then we move to the stem cell transplant, which is where we give about three to five days of more intensive chemo, then the cells back. So all in all, this process is a little bit different to our CHOP in terms of its, its shorter cycles of therapy or less cycles of therapy, I should say, uh, but a more intensive ending to it being the, the stem cell transplant, which requires about two to three, well, usually about three weeks in hospital. So here is the CORAL study, which is one of the larger randomised studies in the relapse setting of salvage therapy. And this was performed back at the, uh, well, they published in 2010. It was around about the turn of the, mill the millennia they, they performed this study. And this was basically saying, look, we, we've got a few salvage schedules by now. Is there one that's better than another? So in this trial, they actually randomised patients with relapse DLBCL to receive either RICE or RDAP two of the salvage schedules and see if there was one that was of benefit. There were a couple of other randomizations later to look at other options, but the main part was the salvage therapy in the, the orange boxes, our ice versus our DAP. What we could see in both arms was that with the more intensive salvage therapies compared to our CHOP, there was about a 16% risk of infection with neutropenia or low white cells. So these schedules, the way they're more intensive, do associate with more toxicity. And that's something we always need to weigh up in the risk and benefit. We also see about 50% of patients needing a platelet transfusion. So the platinum chemotherapy is unfortunately do cause platelets to drop a bit. And that's why we usually need to monitor patients going through salvage therapy with blood tests about, as I say, one to three times a week, depending on what the schedule is that they're receiving. Now, I'm just going to walk you through this slide momentarily because there's a few learning points from it that I'll try and go through. And I'll see if hopefully my laser pointer shows. So the first thing to see here is that these are the two arms, R, R ice in blue and R dap in yellow. And as you can see, there was no difference between the two arms. So overall in this study, about 50% of patients um, were salvaged and they were still in remission and still alive at three years. And that's figure A. What I wanna focus now on is figures C and D. So figure C firstly, this is patients whose lymphoma, their first relapse occurred within 12 months of finishing our chop. So these are what we call the early progressors. And just to give you a little bit of information here, the blue line, when this trial was performed, about half the patients in the study hadn't been treated with rituximab. They'd only received CHOP because this was performed so long ago. So we can sort of ignore the blue line in this, this trial because hopefully most patients these days are receiving our chop as their standard with rituximab. So what you can deduce then is this orange line here, or yellow line we'll say, is patients who had disease that had progressed within 12 months of finishing RCHOP. So in other words, very early progression of disease or relapse. Uh, and if they'd received RCHOP as their primary therapy, this was their what we call event-free survival, which is basically the combination of um, needing a next lymphoma therapy progression or death from any cause. So as you can see back in that era, and, and some of the curves I'll show you later on show much better improvement from this. So don't be losing, um, or what I should be saying at this point is please don't be losing uh, interest or hope at this stage that if lymphoma progresses in 12 months, that, that outcomes are, are very poor like this these days. But what you can see is back in these days, um, outcomes were limited in patients who progressed early. On the right-hand side, however, is patients whose disease progressed after 12 months. So in other words, they had at least a year of remission after RCHOP before they progressed. And as you can see, a lot more patients are in a long-term remission from salvage therapy and stem cell transplant in that scenario. So that gives us a little bit of information in terms of the disease kinetics, according to how early it progresses. And early progression is a risk factor for uh, having a, a less durable remission with salvage therapy and stem cell transplant. So what about for patients who are not eligible for a stem cell transplant, usually older, frailer patients, patients with other health issues that could be problematic? That's where we use less intensive salvage chemotherapies. Um, and in this instance here, um, I give the example of RGEMOX, RVINGEM, things like this, which are a more gentle therapy. They're not more intensive salvages. And these therapies are similarly administered about every three weeks, like RCHOP, two to three weeks, uh, generally for six to eight cycles. And the intention is to induce a remission 
to preserve quality of life to be out of hospital. And what you can see here is the number of patients staying in remission for after these more gentle salvage therapies like Argemox, Arvingem, are unfortunately more guarded. Um, the benefit to them is that they do have some activity, they preserve quality of life, they maintain patients staying out of hospital. They often do lead to remissions, though unfortunately those remissions usually aren't long lasting with these therapies. As you can see in the red box again here, there is a discrimination between patients whose lymphoma progresses early within 12 months or those whose progresses after 12 months. And again, it's similar to the prior study with the, salvage, the more intensive salvages, where patients whose disease progresses early, unfortunately, do have more guarded um, prognosis in terms of likelihood of achieving an, a complete or an overall response and a durable response. So you can see here, ORR is overall response rate. So it's about 80%. Uh, I'm looking now in the red box to the bottom right. So if, if, if the first remission is more than 12 months, then usually about 80% 80, 80 of patients should respond. Whereas if it's within 12 months, we're actually down to about 36% of patients responding uh, to therapy. Um, and as you can see, if we look to the column which says uh, with the percentage where it says number of patients with complete response, uh, you can see about 66% of patients achieve a complete response if their disease progresses after 12 months, whereas that number is down to 18% if it's within 12 months. So that is obviously consideration we have when we're looking at a, someone who's not eligible for uh, an intensive therapy and a salvage if they're progressing early. We're always looking at what options do we have that can improve on this clinical trials, other, uh, so we can always improve on these outcomes. So we've gone through, hopefully we're in the group of patients where we've had one, well, if we've had relapse, where we've had one further line of therapy and we've achieved a durable remission. However, if the lymphoma comes back again, we do have further options that have durable remissions for reasonable numbers of patients. And I mean, long-term durable remissions. So this didn't exist when I was doing my training about 15 years ago, if someone had progressed after salvage and an autologous stem cell transplant, they were deemed incurable back then. And everything that we would do would be about preserving quality and quantity of life in discussion with patients and loved ones. That's changed completely now. We have very effective agents, including these ones and some of the next slides I'll show. But the next consideration is, is this patient eligible for CAR-T therapy? Now, CAR-T, which I'll show you in the next slide, stands for chimeric antigen receptor T cell. It's a form of cellular therapy. And I'll show you in the next slide what it's all about. But some of the considerations about this, again, is the patient well enough? Again, the ECOG performance status, zero to one, can they undertake some lighthouse work type duties? So there is some discrimination about fitness for this. Do they have adequate organ function? Do they have adequate lymphocytes in the blood? Because we have to collect the patient's lymphocytes, send them away to get manufactured and get them back. So if we don't have enough lymphocytes in the blood, then we don't have anything to manufacture from. Do they have no active infection? Nothing that's going to cause them to be unwell while we're going through the procedure. Do they have non-controlled disease? And that's the actual kinetics of their lymphoma. So in other words, there are some patients whose lymphoma, unfortunately, can grow quite quickly, which is a consideration in terms of the amount of time it takes to do the CAR-T, which I'll show you in the next slide. So CAR-T is, is the procedure in the third line as a standard. So CAR-T, I think hopefully many of you will have already been to some of the CAR-T seminars, but if not, I'll give you a one slide overview. It's where we have a patient and we take through the drip their own lymphocytes out, their own T cells. So we remove blood from the patient to get the T cells, we send them to a laboratory that's an accredited laboratory that manufactures them. So in other words, it takes your own T cells. We then basically use a, what's called a sort of a retrovirus to transfect into the cells um, a, a construct, which basically creates your own lymphocytes and turns them into a smart drug or a targeted smart bomb. So when we reinfuse them, they go and destroy the lymphoma. So we take the T cells, we manufacture them to express an antibody which kind of think about it being like rituximab. It's like we've got a rituximab antibody and we're attaching it to your T cells and then putting them back in. We then grow those cells in the lab. 
we then give a little bit of chemotherapy to help soften the bone marrow, which helps to receive the, the uh, T-cells back in. We infuse them back in. And then those T-cells expand because they're your own T-cells. They know your body, so it's not foreign to them. They expand and they then seek and destroy. So they'll go after any cells that express the target protein and the, the targets are restricted to, to um, proteins that are only on our lymphoma cells or B cells uh, and basically attacks them. And T cells are our own immune cells. They usually go and find cells in our body that shouldn't be there, virus infected cells, things like that, and inject their little granules into them and destroy them. So when we do that, why has it become a standard of care? Well, even going back to the first published clinical trial, which was the TISACEL trial, don't try to pronounce these words uh, in the long version, TISACEL is the, the abbreviated version of this form of uh, CAR-T, um, we could see that these were predominantly patients with very poor risk, patients who'd been through multiple lines of therapy previously, who conventionally would have been deemed incurable in the past, progressed post autologous transplant, and we didn't have any other conventional therapies that would associate with a long-term remission. But when we gave CAR T cells in this trial, we actually saw quite remarkably that there were high rates of response and that those responses appeared to be durable. So the gray curve here shows all patients. And as you can see that the overall survival is actually way out beyond uh, we're roughly about the 12 month mark for patients overall. But in patients who achieve a complete response, you can see that that curve is shifted way up. Now, prior to this trial in patients who progressed after autologous stem cell transplant, when we didn't have active agents like this, the median overall survival is about three to six months. It was an incurable disease, but that paradigm has shifted now with agents like this. One thing that's very relevant though, is the amount of time that it takes for the manufacturing. So taking the cells out, sending them often to laboratories in the US to get manufactured, receiving them back can take anywhere between two to eight weeks. And many of you who have encountered uh, DLBCL may know that these nodes can often grow at a relatively rapid rate. And sometimes we are hamstrung by disease that is progressing too quickly to be able to do this procedure and get the cells in effectively before the lymphoma is progressing and causing issues. So even in this clinical trial, you could see they screened 238 patients for the trial. So that's actually already patients who were screened and there will have been patients who wouldn't have been deemed eligible even, so wouldn't have been screened in the first place. But 238 patients were screened, 165 were enrolled in the study and only 111 received an infusion back then. So that just, I guess, gives us an idea that CAR-T can be effective, but isn't for everyone because sometimes the kinetics of the disease are prohibitive to doing this. And we need to look at ways to try and get better disease control to be able to allow the time we need to get the cells collected, manufactured and infused. So one of the things though that you might say is Gareth, okay, if we've got CAR T now and it looks active, why are we still going through this autologous transplant, salvage chemotherapy autograft? Um, especially for patients who progress within 12 months. And I showed you that curve from the coral study, you might remember where it was only about 10% of patients who progressed within 12 months who actually had a long-term remission from their lymphoma with salvage and autograft. So that's the group that's the poorest risk group. That's the group we want to improve on as the greatest degree of urgency. And there's been a number of clinical trials looking at CAR-T in that setting saying, right, what if we move CAR-T into the second line now, not third line? What if we brought it ahead of autologous transplant and salvage? And there were three studies that were reported at the same time, the Zuma 7 study, the TRANSFORM study, and the Belinda trial. And two out of the three showed improvement. So in this study, the Zuma 7, patients had progressed within 12 months of completing their RCHOP. They were randomized to either receive AxiCell, which is one of the CAR-T products, or to receive standard of care, which is salvage therapy, autograft, and see how which group uh, was, was, well, what's the more effective therapy? And what you can see was the initial primary endpoint was median event-free survival. And I mentioned that term before, event-free survival, the composite of time to next lymphoma therapy or progression of disease or death from any cause. And as you can see with AxiCell, there was an improvement, more patients um, with the curve higher who were in an ongoing remission, not needing more therapy uh, compared to standard of care. 
It does come with some side effects though, which I'll come through in, in the next slide as well, which is that um, these therapies uh, do cause uh, neutropenia, so low white cells risk of infection, and that often can persist for up to six months, often needing growth factor support injections to help stimulate the white cells to be up. So infection is one of the risks that we're always looking to prevent and treat. There's this other thing called cytokine release syndrome you see here, 6%. And cytokine release syndrome, I'll show in a bit more in, in the subsequent slides, but is a syndrome where the T cells, when they're reinfused, when they go and attack the lymphoma, can release a lot of inflammatory proteins and cytokines, which can then lead to symptoms of concern in the patient. And I'll show you in a moment some of these. They're manageable. But the reason I show this now is to say that, it, yes, the improvement in overall event-free survival is there, but it's not without risk. There are side effects of CAR-T that we need to uh, be aware of and to manage if they do arise. And this here is the table of the adverse events or the side effects. And I won't, it's, it's very small. You don't need to take it all in and memorize it, but I'll walk you through a few, a few salient parts. Um, on the left is the event or the side effect. Here is the axi cell or the CAR-T group. Here is the standard of care group. And what you can see firstly, if we walk down, is that in the axi cell group, there's very high rates of infection, sorry, I should say fever, pyrexia, and neutropenia or low white cell count. So those are the two main risk factors or side effects that we're always on the lookout for. As well as that, um, we do see some low blood pressure in that group, again, related to the cytokine release syndrome often, um, fatigue and anemia. And these are symptoms that we need to address, we need to monitor for, we need to transfuse red cells. However, as you can see on the right-hand side as well, anemia is very common in the standard of care group because we're giving more intensive chemotherapy, knocking the bone marrow down. So those sorts of side effects are common to both. Cytokine release syndrome doesn't occur in standard of care because we're not giving a cellular therapy product that causes uh, in that, that cytokines or the, the release of the inflammatory proteins. But as you can see here, it occurs of any grade in 92%. So virtually most patients are assured of picking up at least a bit of a, a temperature after the infusion of their cells. But that's often as far as it gets. Often we can give uh, supportive care, some Panadol, some fluids, things like that. But it's when we start to see things like hypotension or low blood pressure, tachycardia or fast heart rate, uh, hypoxia or low oxygen levels. In other words, that there's so much inflammation that suddenly it's like a storm that's developing that we then need to step in. And often that can involve giving some almost like antidotes that switch off some of these cytokines and settle them down. Uh, similarly, quite often patients might need a brief stint in intensive care where we can just monitor to make sure that the blood pressure changes and the heart rate changes are all self-limiting and, and settle down by themselves. Otherwise, we can give some medications to tighten those things up until it settles down. Sometimes we need to give some steroids, which just helps to settle it down through the drip. Um, so all in all, these are treatable side effects, but it is worth mentioning just to give you the idea that this isn't a very straightforward procedure. It is something that needs to be done at specialised sites who have got all of the knowledge and infrastructure to be able to manage these side effects. And down the bottom here is the neurologic events. So unfortunately, when these cytokines and inflammatory storm occurs, sometimes that can cause some neurological symptoms, tremor, confusion, sometimes even uh, some difficulty with speaking. And that's all side effects of the inflammation that can associate with these therapies when the T cells are becoming overstimulated. Again, very similar type ways of switching it off as we do with the cytokine release syndrome, usually self-limiting, usually able to switch it off if we do need to give further medications to re reverse it as antidotes but just something to be aware of that we're on the lookout. So these procedures do require initially staying in hospital for the infusion part, usually up to seven days, uh, and then often close monitoring as an outpatient uh, for up to 28 days until this period of time settles down. So CAR-T eligible. Now, what if we aren't eligible for CAR-T for whatever reason, whether it's the kinetics of the disease, whether it's um, some of those other eligibility things I showed, or what if our disease progresses after CAR T cell? Well, this is where we've got a really exciting number of therapies coming through. And the reason I'll show you in a moment is because we are seeing some durability of responses here as well. So if you step back for a moment, you might recall the statement I made earlier saying when I was training 15 years ago, that if someone progressed after salvage chemotherapy and a stem cell transplant, then they were deemed incurable back then because we honestly didn't have therapies that were effective for patients. Now with CAR-T, now with bispecific antibodies and some of the other therapies that I'll show, we're actually in a position where we have agents that can give us more 
opportunities to induce a long-term remission for patients. And currently, a lot of the clinical trials are looking at how, what combinations of these can we use to get that even for more patients in the longer term. So clinical trials, uh, polituzumab with bendetumustine, rituximab, bispecific antibodies, immunotherapy. I've put little asterisks, asterisks next to these because currently there's no standard approved therapy in this space. So the best way that we are able to access these therapies currently remains through clinical trials at the moment, but there are some access pathways. And again, when discussing these, if, if we're in a situation where it's relevant, then please speak with your haematologist openly and say, you know, what are these options? What are the next options? How do I get hold of these? What are the side effects, et cetera? And we'll come to that in a moment. So do we have data to say what are the more promising options after if the lymphoma comes back after a, a CAR-T transplant? And as it is, yes, we do. Gloria Iacoboni uh, presented at a session at the American Society of Hematology Congress in December, um, where basically she had put together a collection from 12 academic centres uh, where 217 patients had received CAR-T therapy and then progressed. It had been a prior approved CAR-T, so it was only the ones that are the standard ones, not some of the newer clinical trial ones. Um, so there was some uniformity to the patients in terms of what therapies they'd received. And the next treatments here are, are shown. So I've put on the left, just to give you the legend for what the x-axis here is. So POLA stands for a polituzumab-based therapy. And I'll, in a moment, I'll give you examples of these. BITE stands for bispecific T-cell engager, which is another term we use for bispecific antibody, which I'll also come to. ICI stands for immune checkpoint inhibitor. These are your more standard immuno-oncology agents, things that have got a lot of the media attention for things like melanoma in recent times in Australia, also for things like Hodgkin lymphoma uh, that we use where they've become a standard of care. And CT on the right is chemotherapy. And I should mention what's not shown in this bar graph was the patients for whom supportive care was chosen because further therapies are not appropriate for everyone. Clearly, if we've got patients who are of extremes of age with significant comorbidities, use the example of someone who's bed bound in a nursing home from other, other comorbidities, it might be someone who them and their loved ones would consider that maybe no therapy or no active therapy is the best therapy for them. What you can see here in these bar charts, however, are the response rates to these different therapies. So on the right here, you can see CR or complete remission in yellow, PR or partial response in green, stable disease in light blue, progressive disease in dark blue. And as you can see, the greatest proportion of patients who achieved a, a response, an overall response, um, including a CR or PR was with polituzumab based therapy. Next was a bite or a bispecific T-cell engager then other immune checkpoint inhibitors, and then chemotherapy was far behind. So again, retrospective study, so take it with a pinch of salt, but just gives us a little bit of data to suggest what agents we should be looking to perhaps if lymphoma does come back after a CAR-T transplant. So we'll firstly have a quick look at polituzumab. Polituzumab is an antibody drug conjugate. What that means is it's kind of like rituximab, it's an antibody that is designed to bind to a protein on the surface of the lymphoma cells. In the case of polituzumab, it's, um, it's bound against a, a target CD79, which is a CD79 is a protein on the surface of our B cells, like CD20, which rituximab targets. The difference with polituzumab is it actually is more intense. So basically it binds to the cells. It's a prodrug, so it's an antibody with a drug conjugated to it. It's inactive when it goes into the drip. It binds to the protein on the surface of the lymphoma cells and gets taken into the cell. Once it's in the cell, it then gets cleaved, and that's when the active drug gets released. And that's what we call MMAE or monomethyl A, which comes from some form of naturally occurring shellfish, not one that we eat. Um, and basically, that then is a very potent chemotherapy, so potent that we couldn't give it as a raw drug through the drip. But when it's only active inside the cells, it can be effective against the lymphoma cells, which is why we have a good therapeutic window. Um, for those of you who are familiar with CHOP, the o, o in CHOP stands for Oncovin or Vincristine. 
MMAE works through a similar mechanism, but is about 10 to 100 times more potent depending on the assay that you test it with. So it's kind of like a supercharged vincristine, which is the O in, in CHOP. So in polituzumab, we give it with bendamustine and rituximab. That's how the trials were done. As you can see here from the trials, there were actually two cohorts. So initially there was the randomized group who uh, was randomized against bendamustine and rituximab, which is bendamustine, the chemo, and rituximab, the antibody which was a standard of care. When we give it with polituzumab, you can see here that the curve shifts upwards. In other words, more patients who are still in remission for longer. Down the bottom, and I apologize, these slides keep slipping. Down the bottom, they did an extension cohort or expansion cohort where there was no randomization. Everyone got this. And that was because we needed more data to just say, right, how effective is it, which was to assist the FDA in the US to, to give it its approval for this indication. And as you can see, the median progression-free survival is actually beyond about eight months. So the majority of patients are getting good activity. It's keeping them out of hospital. It's delivered in the day centers. It's administered uh, once a month. And then the patients go ahead and come into the day center. So it's well-tolerated, good quality of life, induces remissions for a large number of patients. Unfortunately, a number of patients do relapse with it, but there is potentially a, a plateau to the curve. Potentially there are some patients whose disease stays in remission after this. So certainly active, certainly well-tolerated, but not the cure for everyone. And in terms of side effects, generally well tolerated. I'm gonna skip on a little bit now because I'm getting towards time. But basically you can see here that aside from some mild neutropenia, some mild drop in the platelet counts, um, generally well tolerated. And the main thing I highlight here is peripheral neuropathy because that's the main side effect of vincristine in this class of vinca alkaloids or chemos. Not really seen all that much in this therapy. So generally well tolerated, not much in the way of peripheral neuropathy or damage to the nerve endings in the fingers. Uh, what about bispecific antibodies? Okay, think of rituximab, which is the antibody, we call it a monoclonal, it binds to a protein on the surface of the lymphoma cells and tags them so your immune system identifies them and destroys them. In a bispecific antibody, we often have a CD20 arm, which is like rituximab, connected to a CD3 arm, which binds to your T cells. So it's basically a way that we can get our own T cells to come and say, this cell doesn't belong here, inject your poisonous granules and destroy it. And there's a little bit of a review here that some of our research fellows, Ross Salvaris and Jeremy Ong, put together with me a couple of years ago. So if you wanted to have a look at that, please reach out to me. I'm very happy to, to pass the paper through. And there's a few more recent ones that are a bit more contemporary. That was a couple of years ago. But you might see some of these names in development, lofitimab, epicritimab, mosinutuzumab, Odronextamab, these are some of the more clinically advanced uh, therapies going through currently. So firstly, glofitimab, it's a good success story for Australia. A lot of our sites have actually been involved in the clinical development. Uh, Michael Dickinson at the Peter Mac was the lead author and heavily invested in the stage one or the early phase study. Um, many of us have been uh, involved in the later stage development of this drug. So it's great to be part of really exciting agents and, and getting these into Australian patients in need. Um, so in this first study, this was glofitimab for relapsed or refractory DLBCL. What you can see here is that these patients who were on this trial were very heavily pretreated. Median, meaning the middle number of patients had had three prior lines of therapy with a range of two to seven. I often struggle to list seven lines of therapy and you can imagine the, the journey that must've been for that poor patient. But what you can see here is the number of patients most had actually had three or more lines of therapy. And what you can see here is quite remarkable response. This is an antibody. It's not chemo. It's not a cellular therapy like CAR-T. It's an antibody like rituximab. It's off the shelf, straight into the patient in the trial. Uh, overall response rate of 52%, complete response rate of 39%. Again, in patients who are on median had had three prior lines of therapy. This is remarkable. And as you can see in figure B here is the progression-free survival for the main analysis cohort. In other words, for all patients. So unfortunately, we do still see um, patients progressing with time, although the curve certainly has shifted up from prior therapies that we'd seen before. But what's really remarkable is if we look at patients who achieve a complete response, these 39% of patients are in this panel here. So then you can see that we're seeing high numbers of patients would appear to have durable remissions. So there's a suggestion here that this actually can be another bite at the cherry to get a long-term remission in someone who's potentially already been through RCHOP, salvage therapy and autograft, potentially CAR-T. In fact, here, I think there was a CAR-T. 33% uh, of patients on this trial had been through CAR-T. So even for patients in fourth line or beyond, there are therapies that can induce durable or long-term remissions. Again, you'll see some of these side effects very similar to CAR-T. Uh, it is a 
therapy that is using your T-cells as the active heavy lifter. And the same side effects can be seen as in CAR-T, fevers, low oxygen levels, cytokine release syndrome, sometimes even those neurological symptoms, we call them ICANs. But again, similar management, similar observations to CAR-T, treatable and manageable. Uh, just to give you an idea that there is more than one, here's epcaritimab, um, which is another version of a, a, uh, a bispecific antibody. This is what we call a waterfall plot, meaning if we look at the dimensions of different nodes in a patient with lymphoma and then give them the treatment and look at the percentage reduction of all of their nodes overall, um, you can see here that 50% or more reduction in, in the sum of the products of their diameters, SPD we call it, um, shows the majority of patients achieving a reduction in the size of their lymphomas, uh, their lymph nodes. Uh, the blue lines are patients with complete remission. And these little asterisks down here are patients who'd been through CAR-T before. So again, showing you that this is an active therapy, even in patients who've been through CAR-T. And on the right-hand side here is the progression-free survival. Again, remarkable. And if you'd show me these curves 15 years ago, I would have said this isn't possible. And it just gives you an idea of how far we've come in that time and potentially you know, how much uh, better things can get as we continue along with new therapies. So basically that's our current pathway of relapsed DLBCL. And you can see, the, I guess the take home message from this algorithm, are there are points at which we make decisions and clinical decisions um, in combination with patients and, and loved ones, uh, which involve some of the discussions around the kinetics of disease, uh, fitness for therapy and things like that. Now, I haven't spoken about radiotherapy. There's not really much data out there on radiotherapy alone in the relapse setting. And believe it or not, these 18 patient series from Monash Health it really represents one of the largest data sets in the world, which is why I put it up here. We put this out a couple of years ago. And what we saw was that if patients have relapse or refractory disease in a single gland only, so in other words, they've had their treatment and they've either got one area of, of refractory disease so a single area that's irradiatable or a single area of relapse and we give radiotherapy, potentially somewhere around 30 to 40% of those patients with a single site of active disease can have long-term remission. So again, just a very small number of data, uh, very small number of patients, limited data, retrospective, but also suggests that there potentially is a, a role for radiotherapy in very select situations. So... What else do we have? Well, clinical trials. Um, I've gone through some of those that are most available at the moment, but the main thing to say is that um, we currently, the, the agents I've spoken about are not currently all approved and reimbursed in Australia. They're still going through these pathways. So clinical trials remain our best way to get access to these studies uh, and these agents for patients with relapse lymphoma. There are other agents, which is I'll show you in a moment, but polituzumab, bispecific antibodies, things like this, are uh, really the ones that are coming through in the most advanced uh, form in clinical development. But just bring you back to this again, and this is why not every patient's journey is the same. We appreciate that at a molecular level, at a genetic level, patients have differences in their lymphoma in terms of what's causing it. And more recently, work's been done in laboratories to say, how can we get some patterns so we're not dealing with a thousand and one different versions of lymphoma, but rather some more select groups. And what we've actually seen is that what we call gene clustering, meaning some of these mutations cause similar issues, similar pathways and of what we call oncogenic dependency, similar proteins and enzymes that our lymphoma depends on. And this here represents really some of the ways that we're starting to look at our relapsed lymphoma patients when we're undertaking genetic sequencing to see what are the dependencies of this patient's lymphoma. Um, and the reason it's relevant is because potentially there are some drugs in clinical development, believe it or not, abrutinib, which is a, what we call an enzyme inhibitor, a BTK inhibitor. It's used in chronic lymphocytic leukemia and mantle cell lymphoma. It's approved and reimbursed in that indication. Um, there are patients with relapsed lymphoma who seem to respond to abrutinib in some settings. Uh, and that's actually subject to some clinical trials in the front line currently still. So agents like this, we've got a lot of small molecule inhibitors being developed. And where I'm heading with this as a clinical trialist who spends most of my week sweating on relapsed and refractory DLBCL is that we are advocating to design our trials better so that we can identify what is causing this patient's lymphoma to be resistant to treatment so that we can actually have better therapies to, to beat it. And it's no coincidence that the only therapies that have moved through clinical trial development to approval like CAR-T and polituzumab and bispecifics are ones that target 
cell surface proteins. In other words, they don't care what's going on within the cell itself. And that's why a lot of our targeted therapies when we've looked in clinical trials have failed so far, because if we've got a, a protein that's only, uh, let's say, 30% of patients' lymphomas will depend on this protein and we give it to everyone with lymphoma, well, by definition, we're setting ourselves up to fail because 70% of patients' lymphomas don't care about that protein. So we'll keep looking at this, and this is what we'll keep discussing in the clinical trials currently to see how we can improve upon what we're doing. Um, but basically, what I wanted to say was that if we're in a scenario of being encountering relapsed lymphoma, we don't like it. You don't like it. We don't like it. And the first thing to do is take a deep breath and it's okay to swear. We definitely do. And commonly in our clinics, in our MDTs, it's, it's the disappointment to say, we've been through this journey already with our chop. Damn, it's back. We don't always say damn. Talk with your hematologist about the next steps. What is it that you and your loved ones would want to do? What's appropriate? And I, I unfairly use that analogy of a patient bed bound in a nursing home with comorbidities, but basically to say that um, it's not always appropriate to give everyone the most intensive therapy. I think my camera, there we go, it's come back. Um, what are the treatment options? Clinical trials, standard of care, alternative options, speak to us about whatever is, is on your mind, supportive care options. Now I mentioned supportive care as well because it is a journey and we know that not everyone is gonna have a long-term remission. And sometimes we will even say, look, we need to start thinking about getting experts involved who can help with symptom management because sometimes symptoms can be as, as relevant as the disease itself. So I'm just gonna keep. So don't be alarmed or concerned if we're sometimes um, saying that we'd like to you know, get along our palliative care physicians to come and, and meet and look at what other symptoms we can improve upon as we go through journeys of further therapies. It's all part of the, the, the journey. Uh, and what about support? Well, obviously you've got Lymphoma Australia, these wonderful people. You've got our allied health teams, our social workers particularly, because obviously you're probably thinking in parallel, more time off work, you know, what am I gonna do about family? What am I gonna do about finances? All these things. And that's where our social workers and teams are there. Our nurses, our nurse specialists are amazing. And the final take home message is please, as I say, don't lose hope. This is a very different landscape to where we were 15 years ago. We've now got multiple therapies which can be effective for patients in the relapsed and refractory setting and induce durable remissions for subsets of patients with relapsed disease. And with that, I just wanna thank everyone here, patients and their families, without all of you, um, being willing to undergo clinical trials, new therapies, to be able to see what, you know, what we believe can be the next best thing to improve the outcomes. Uh, and we're seeing that then turn into standard of care therapies and improving on those. To our oncology nurses, our pharmacies, our allied health staff, these therapies are becoming increasingly complicated to deliver and they are just phenomenal in their capacity to keep absorbing more and more difficult work to our support networks, Lymphoma Australia, Leukemia Foundation, et cetera. And finally, to these people, this is our research team at Monash Health, just for haematology research only. Um, and you could copy and paste them across Australia and internationally, the amount of work that these guys are doing in, in, in a more um, complicated landscape of trials uh, is quite remarkable. And we're really lucky to have uh, energetic, diverse teams uh, uh, with us on our journey. So I'll leave it at that. Um, and very happy to, to engage in discussion and, and hopefully uh, take any questions you might have. Thanks for having me. Thank you so much, Gareth. I think on behalf of us and I think all the patients, I think we want to start by thanking you for all the work that you do with your clinical trials because, I mean, I remember nursing back in those days when we didn't have anything else other than this and for you to come along and show us just how far we have, what you guys have come in this clinical trial space and now what is available, like starting with CAR-T and then if that doesn't work, all the other clinical trials that we do have available. It's just amazing to be able to think how far we have come. Um, I think you answered quite a few questions throughout the webinar. You were quite great. Patients were asking them and then you were answering their questions in, in your talk naturally. So I've answered a couple already. Um, I think there's a couple of things. Well, I, I can ask you the questions and then there's probably a couple that I'd love to ask as well. So some someone said back when you're talking about um, stem cell transplant, um, do some people go straight from CHOP to stem cell transplant or is it only in the place of relapse? Yeah, good question. Um, if someone has resistant disease, so in other words, if we don't achieve a complete remission with CHOP, 
then we know that disease is likely to progress. Unfortunately, DLBCL, if it's not in a complete remission, it tends to progress and it tends to progress early. So usually on our PET scans that we do either during or at the end of treatment, if we see relapsed or progressing disease or even resistant disease, we usually will be starting the discussion with patients about intensification and transplant. Now, centres might do interim response scans at different times. I'm sorry, it's a bit of a lag with my camera. I apologise. Some patients uh, sometimes will do interim response assessments. So already in those areas where we're doing it halfway through, we might already get a feel for someone whose disease is progressing. And we might even start to suggest, look, let's go on with the next cycle of our chop, but we want to get a biopsy of one of these sites. It's not responding well enough. You know, we don't want to be sitting around and then we start planning towards uh, salvage and autograph. So yes, some patients do move straight to autologous transplant. Great, thank you. Um, someone's asked, are low immunoglobulins before any treatment a concern? So IgA, a, IgM, or does NHL cause low IgEs or something else? Yep, great question. Someone's very well informed. Um, so immunoglobulins are our healthy antibodies that we make from our B cells and from our plasma cells. Um, some patients, when they present with lymphoma, because their lymphoma has been there for a while and it's become their predominant clone, if you like, will have low antibodies or immunoglobulins when they present. That's not of concern. We give the treatment nonetheless. If we encounter any infections in a patient that are either ra not rapid to respond or a bit chronic in nature and someone's got low immunoglobulins, then we can give them some replacement immunoglobulins that we get from lifeblood. Um, there is a small subset of patients whose lymphoma can arise in the setting of an underlying immunodeficiency. And so if someone's got really low, and I'm talking about almost absent IgG, IgA, IgM, all of them, then we might sometimes ask ourselves the question and say, has this patient got an underlying immunodeficiency that this has arisen from? And that's not usually changing what we do. Usually our chops what we do, but it just might be a little bit of an extra thing we do on the side while we're looking through it. But no, not of concern, manageable if it is. And it is quite common when someone presents to have low, low immunoglobulins. Okay. Um, someone has said at relapse, would you complete a nodal biopsy or would a fine needle aspirate be suffice? Yeah, good question. A um, couple of different biopsies we can use. An FNA or a fine needle aspirate is usually not adequate for lymphoma because often to see lymphoma, we need to see some of the architecture, how it looks under a microscope. So that requires at minimum a core needle biopsy, which is a slightly wider gauge biopsy to do it. That's the minimum. Uh, an FNA or fine needle aspirate is where you're just sucking a few cells out and smearing on a slide and often you can't tell whether it's DLBCL or whether it could be a low-grade lymphoma or something like that. Um, so a core biopsy can be adequate. An excisional biopsy usually means there's very little uncertainty as to what you're dealing with. So it could be either a core needle or a, an excisional where we actually take a note out. I suppose we always try to say excisional biopsies are prime. If we could get them on everyone, it'd be amazing. But I mean, a core biopsy is great. Finally, less, but probably not. Yep. Um, someone said, thank you so much for doing these. Thank you for your, um, so the, the times for remission before remission seems low. Is this because there, these times are from recent trials and we do not know if this remission will continue longer term? Yeah. So I think the, if I understand correctly, the question is asking that with the survival curves, that we're only seeing quite short follow-up for a lot of these trials. Um, that is true. CAR-T, the Schuster study I showed you of TISA cell was only published in 2018. Unfortunately, a lot of clinical trials when they're first developed are only designed to go for about five years. And the reason we've usually said that's adequate is because generally speaking, if we get to five years and we're in remission with lymphoma, usually by and large, we should be in the clear longer term. Um, we're encouraging industry who, who sponsor all of these studies to do longer term follow-up so we can actually capture longer term to see what is the true remission rates, but also what's the quality of life of those patients beyond five years, which is equally as important. Um, but yeah, correct. In summary, particularly the bispecifics, particularly the polituzumab, those are more recent therapies. The follow-up is shorter, so we do need longer term uh, follow-up to see how durable those remissions can be. So I just want to quickly head back to some of the last slides. I think there was there was one that was talking about connecting um, who to see. I think a lot of our patients, we have to remember, can be in private hospitals who don't necessarily have access to great allied health in terms of um, 
social workers, welfare workers. Um, and just to let those people know that if they do need to reach out to someone, we can also help you connect with other people that you need to speak to. Um, you did touch on palliative care and trying to remove that stigma that's attached to palliative care, which, which is a common problem for a lot of our patients. Um, do you also do you also attach um, palliative care to some patients just for say symptom relief, not necessarily for end of life cares? Can you explain that a little? Uh, bit? Absolutely. Um, as haematologists in general, we classically have been very poorly viewed in terms, and and it's more for my. I, I'm going to say here, I'm going to kick them while they're down. More the leukemia colleagues, leukemia treating colleagues, who often are, are, are chastised for being very late to engage palliative care, but Yes, 100%. What I, I usually will do is if I see a patient who I believe has symptoms that are not adequately controlled, we are very good at diagnosing lymphoma, treating lymphoma, managing side effects of lymphoma. But there are people who are experts in symptom management. And I think previously we were a bit hesitant to bring them in because of the stigma, you know, particularly in some of our patients um, who uh, culturally might see palliative care is death and dying, we've turned that around, I like to think, and I often will engage that discussion early. I'll often say, look, right now we've got a pathway, our, our intent remains to induce a remission and hopefully for that remission to be long-term and dare I say curative, but there will be symptoms along the way and I'd like to get the palliative care physicians involved who can assist us. And I think particularly in areas like um, low appetite, low energy, things like that. There's actually a lot of things that they can offer that we don't often empirically offer straight up. Uh, and secondly, they have clinical trials as well, things that could potentially improve some of those areas uh, because the sort of supportive care and the quality of life is so important. So yeah, I would say that I make most of my referrals to palliative care, not with the intention of end of life care, but rather to improve symptom management. And I'm encouraging my colleagues and particularly the, our fellows, those who train with us at Monash to do the same because um, you know there's a lot of patients out there and resources are limited and getting as many team members and as much community support as well with community pal care is, is, is that extra level of reassurance. Excellent. And that's like, I just want to remind patients that just because you are being referred to palliative care, it, it doesn't mean that end of life. They, they have access to so many more drugs that, that hematologists don't necessarily know the intricate details of. So it's more sometimes just for that pain relief, that, that nausea relief, all those sorts of things. So that's, I just wanted to point that out to them because sometimes they do freak out. The other thing yep. that I would like to maybe bring up, so a lot of our patients who could be a DLBCL who live in a rural area, they might just have their R-chop um, and then they go back home. But once they relapse, how do you, so, I mean, it's pro some of these treatments are not offered in their areas. How, or how would you recommend they get into another centre to discuss these options? Yeah, great question. So look, usually in the relapse setting, if there are um, situations where there's a treatment that would be a standard of care or even a trial treatment that's not offered locally, quite often your, your clinician, your haematologist, your oncologist would be reaching out to those of us who do have those therapies and saying, how can we logistically do this? And I'll use the example of CAR-T. Currently, there's only a, a number of CAR-T centres in some states, not all states have them, um, but many of those centres now are resourced to be able to provide uh, accommodation for patients when they're undergoing um, visits leading up to, during and beyond CAR-T. Um, so the main thing to do would be speak with your haematologist and just say, look, I believe there's therapies, you know, what else is available? Um, if something is available elsewhere, can we start the discussion about, you know, what that involves and be informed about it? Um, and just if you are thinking of CAR-T or interested in it, we did do a CAR-T webinar and I highly recommend um, to go and watch that one. It was from last year. It will be on YouTube. It just goes through the... Um, the practical details of getting to CAR T because it's not just being at that hospital for that time, it is the time afterwards, how long you're not allowed to drive for, those sorts of practical details. Um, sorry, so someone has said um, if your patients have had CAR T and need further treatment, what is the wait time before the next treatment, i.e., like a clinical trial? Yeah, quick is the short answer. Um, usually, post CAR T, we still remain 
on alert because we do see patients who can progress early. Um, if we see a 12 month remission in CAR T, so in other words, we're following closely, once we get to 12 months, usually that's a really promising sign in terms of durability. So in the first 12 months, we monitor closely. We actually do do routine PET scans at 28 days, six months and 12 months. So we're looking hard. Um, if we see it, we move quickly and there are a number of different options. We often say, are there clinical trials available in this setting? Um, if not, are there other agents that we could potentially access either through standard of care or compassionate access pathways there. I showed that example of polituzumab versus by specific antibodies versus immuno-oncology agents. There's some other small molecule agents, drugs like lenalidomide. Uh, again, I'm speaking about drugs which is off-label use currently. These aren't approved and reimbursed for use in this indication, so it needs to be done through your specialist. But yes, um, we look closely because we want to treat it before it, it, it becomes more bulky, more advanced, patient more unwell, and less likely for subsequent therapies to work. Um, I just want to remind patients too that often there's a financial um, assistance if you're needing to get to a bigger centre to get into a clinical trial. There are often financial assistance available to you under the clinical trial. So just think of that if you do want to get to a centre. Do you have a couple of last questions, but I think that we're sort of running out of time. And I, I think a lot of them, um, someone has said that can an autologous transplant cause disease to progress quicker, was in remission after RCHOP and had a transplant and relapse. Yeah. Um, does chemotherapy accelerate disease and stem cell transplant accelerate disease? No, not in terms of the biology of how these therapies should be hopefully inducing remission. So it doesn't cause lymphoma to progress quicker. Um, unfortunately, it's just that sometimes if lymphoma is resistant to, to, to treatment, it can continue a trajectory of growth. Um, and that's why we're usually on the lookout quite soon after transplants, doing a PET scan afterwards to see if there is disease progressing. So um, no, not, not mechanistically anyway that, that I've seen or that I'm aware of in terms of how chemotherapy should work on, on uh, lymphoma that it would accelerate disease. Okay, thanks, Gareth. I think we might leave it there for the questions. And I just really, again, thank you for your time today. I think you explained everything perfectly and I hope that patients got a lot from it. I'm sure they did. Um, just a reminder to everyone watching, if you could fill out the um, survey at the end, it's just very quick, it just helps us plan further for the future for you guys. Um, so again, thank you everyone for joining us and thank you Gareth for your time. Thanks everyone.